Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Chahadi, and I'm here with Darren Elias. He is one of the competitors in the Joker's Gambit and a many time World Poker Tour champion. I'm not doing the grid, so I don't remember how many it's four. All right. Four. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I, know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you won something online in the, in the past year or something. Not yet. So, um, yeah, I looked at a bunch of your games on chess.com. You're preparing for the tournament by playing a, a lot of. It looks like game 10, which is in the time control of the tournament, which is fantastic. And mm -hmm. I noticed that like many players are having a lot more trouble with black than with white. Now, one mm -hmm. thing I, I didn't realize this was because of Levy Rosman's um, suggestion, because I know Levy's a fantastic coach. So um, I don't want to rag on it too hard, but I do have some philosophical problems with you playing E6 against D4. Okay. Um, what, like, can you tell me why that might be a bad idea? Um, not really, I guess. I, I don't know enough about the fundamentals. It's, uh, maybe it's too passive. It's, it's not taking up enough space in the center. Um, opens, it does open up lines for my queen and bishop, which I like, but, um, yeah, I don't really know why it's bad. Okay. Well, actually it's not a bad move per se. It's not like a, a bad move. What it is, it's, you just told me like five minutes ago, we were off air, but you just told me like five minutes ago that you want to play Sicilian as black, right? Mm -hmm. So what can white do now after which you won't be able to play the Sicilian anymore? Um, E4? Yeah, so basically now you have to play the French. Okay. So you've put yourself in a situation where you have to learn the French and the Sicilian, which is when, you know, E4 is actually the most popular move by a long margin, I think at the amateur level. So mm -hmm. you have to play against the French, which is a bit, which is a big bummer because you also just told me off air that you don't like closed positions and the French is the like quintessential closed position. Like the most oh, really? popular move here is E5 okay. or sometimes people actually knight C3 is also really popular, but it's usually followed up with E5. So what you see is like the position is getting closed. Like the French would actually be like the last thing I would recommend for you. Okay. And I'm not sure if like Levy has some like specific advice, maybe he's played some kind of, maybe plays here or something. I'm not sure, but it's definitely not, it's definitely likely to lead to some kind of French ish position, Frenchy position. You just can't avoid it. This is the French. I mean, it says it okay. right there. If you look on chess.com, I told you to go to the other tab, but if you look, it just, it says the French defense. It is the French defense. So, okay. um, is it possible that this is part of a Levy Rosman repertoire that is D4, E6 and B6, um, against D4 and then a French against E4? My guess would be yes. Yeah. It's possible. My yeah. late night YouTube studies didn't, were not complete and I didn't get the whole message and I'm playing it versus the wrong opening. <laughs> totally possible. Yeah, I, I think that might be. I'd have to do some research into Levy's recommended opening um, sets, but because I've seen some of his recommended openings and I thought they're some really good ones. He mm -hmm. he gave a lesson to Nemo about beating the Carol Khan that I thought was really good. So mm -hmm. he definitely has a lot of like great openings, even if he's recommending them to like um, new players. There, there's still like a lot of solidity, but I just don't think this one works if you want to play the Sicilian because it just doubles your work and you're an amateur chess player who's more focused on poker. Like you can't double your work, you know, and learn the French and the Sicilian when you just told me you don't like closed position. So yeah. that's a bit of a problem. I, I don't, I kind of wanted to talk more about the Sicilian today. Cause that's like my expertise. That's my favorite opening. But okay. I think that this is just something we need to think about, like, um, what to do against D4. Cause I don't think it's E6. Um, you could think about something that's a little bit similar, start with knight S6 and then after C4, because you know this is so cool knight f6 why is this the most popular move because it stops e4 yeah like, okay that, that that's why you know e6 allows e4 and mm -hmm. now if they play c4 now you can play kind of similar stuff like that levy was teaching and eventually develop your bishop this way but you never allowed it an easy e4 they have okay. to work to play e4 you know they usually and usually they work hard to do it they try to control the square. Sometimes they even play for F3 to get E4 in. So okay. it's a real battle for the square. And you, just, unless you are a French, um, a Francophile, like you don't really want to let them play E4 in the first move, uh, on the second move rather. Okay.
So we'll start I start with this night move and then I can do D6. Yeah. And maybe you want to get another lesson on this or look up some videos on this. It's called the Nimzo Indian and the Queen's Indian. Um, so the basics of the Nimzo Indian is if they play knight c3 here, um, you can play bishop b4, which is the Nimzo Indian. And if they play knight f3, you can play like this, which again, it's starting to look familiar to what Levy was showing you. It's called the Queen's Indian defense. Okay. Um, and yes, the whole point of this is similar lines to what he was showing you, um, but not allowing them to force you into a French defense. Okay. Uh, and yeah, that, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, I'm all about avoiding the French and close position. So if that will help, I'm in. Yeah, yeah. And, and the Sicilian is a great opening. It's my favorite opening. Unfortunately, sometimes they don't open the position. <laughs> there's, there's lots of different ways to play against the Sicilian and the weaker the player, and that's kind of an unfortunate news is the worse the player is, the more likely they are to just like not play the open variation, which is super fun. Like uh -huh. it's great to play the open variation for you because um, you get to have an open position as black. Your the C file is open. There's lots of active play, but the weaker the opponent, the more likely they are, they are to just play some garbage that doesn't open the position. But <laughs> That's good. There's also a silver lining there. Like mm -hmm. so I've seen some of your opponents. I was looking at your games, and some of them just play like bishop c4. I, don't, I mean, this move it it doesn't open the position, but it's also not a good move because think about why bishop c4 is so popular um, in double king pawn openings. Um, there's a real big reason for it. Double king mm -hmm. pawn meaning uh, if I play e5. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I always think at my level when people play this that they're going to bring the queen out and try to do some quick attack, um, like scholars made style. But yeah. I, I don't yeah. I mean, the, the the thing is, when there's a pawn here, um, this bishop attacks this pawn on f7, right? And, yeah. You know, that's a really like dangerous situation and. A lot of quick victories, certainly against kindergartners. I'm yeah. sure I'm sure Cora's like out there of waiting that by now. <laughs> now that she's, she's turned four. Yeah, she's got the scars made ready. <laughs> yeah. It used to be like seven or eight that people got that down, but now you know, kids are kids are so good. They kids got the, sharp these days. Yeah, they got like the chess kid and the play magnets. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, play magnets just came out with play Judith. You should check that out too. Yeah, I don't know about play magnets. I gotta look I gotta look into that. Yeah, it's like, oh, Play Magnus is like this app where you get to play Magnus at all these different ages. So you play Magnus when he oh. was like five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. And he gets like better every age, obviously. Uh -huh. um, and Judah Polgar is, you know, obviously one of the most, um, probably the most famous chess prodigy in history, except maybe Bobby Fischer, like just mm -hmm. so incredible. So they, they basically made a version with Judah now. So that could be cool. Oh, cool. Um, but anyway, like when the pawn's on c5, bishop c4 is not nearly as effective because you play e6 and now bishop's not attacking f7 and you get to play for d5 and you win a tempo against the bishop. So it's basically like a twofer reason that bishop c4 is not super, super effective. Um, yeah, that's, that's usually the response I do. Is there a better way to punish it or is that it? You just play e6, b, d5. Is that what the um, pawn is? I think e6, d5, but this is so rare in a way at the higher level. I'm just looking at opening explorer right now on chess.com. Uh, Nobody I, good plays that. Yeah, I, I think e6, d5 right away is correct, but you could also potentially throw in knight c6. I'm not sure if I really want to. Which I've yeah. probably been throwing in because I play it a lot. Yeah, I, I think I'd probably just play e6 right away, yeah. I, I like it. And and already black is doing quite fine. The thing is they could play knight c3 and like stop you from playing d5, right? So you can't necessarily get it right away, mm -hmm. uh, but you will build it up. And then when you play knight c6, it's cool because now you're kind of threatening to play knight f6. Mm -hmm. They can't play e5 anymore. So you're, you're, it's almost like you're white and they're black all of a sudden, like you're, you, you have the initiative and are kind of like threatening things and they have to kind of like react which uh -huh. it goes to show it's just like not that great a move. So. Okay.
And uh, the other anti-Sicilian thing that people do a lot is they try to play for C3 and build a big center. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other thing that they do a lot, uh, we talked right before the lesson about how you've been playing about knight C6 here. Mm -hmm. And I said, I think you should play D6 instead because it's a little bit more likely that they will open the position here. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the sidelines and the anti-Sicilians aren't quite as effective. Whereas when you play knight c6, their anti-Sicilian moves are very good, actually. Like even like you saw Magnus Carlsen play Fabiano Caruana in the World Championship two years ago. I don't know if you follow those games because like a lot of people, you've probably gotten a little bit more into chess lately. Mm-hmm. You know, the Queen's Gambit, your daughter, and now like Hikaru's, you know, chess poker combo. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of those, um, openings were Bishop B5 here. So basically Fabiano Caruana, who's like one of the best prepared chess players in history. I mean, he's so well prepared. Um, if you go back to his result in the Singfield cup in 2014, you'll see that he wins some games just straight out of the opening. Like even Fabiano Caruana thought that Bishop B5 might be the best move here, you know? Mm -hmm. Eventually in the world championship, he started switching to D4, indicating that he was like maybe on the fence and his team was working on making D4 work, but Mm -hmm. it's a really close call. You know, that's, that's what he was indicating. So uh, that's why I like D6. You're more likely to get something a little bit more fun. And that was a game that I wanted to show you today actually is in that line. Um, You know, I always love the Sicilian. I think the first time I saw the dragon play out on the board, I like immediately switched from E5 to C5. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking at Judith Polgar's games and I was like fully converted. Um, But this game, which was played in 1999 by Alexander Grisha, was I think one of my favorite Sicilian games of all time. Okay. And Alexander Grisha is a special name when you talk about chess and poker. Um, Have you heard much about Sasha Grisha? No, I don't. I don't know who that is. Mm. Well, like, honestly, Alexander Grishuk is the, um, is the, uh, the absolute um, le- most legendary chess poker player. Okay. Um, he is been many times um, in the top 10 players in the world. Right now he's number six. I think he's been as high as three or four in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's one of the best players in the world. And he's also played um, nosebleed um, high stakes poker. Really? Um, Particularly PLO. Yeah. I Caxton, like people have like played with Alexander Risha. Wow. Do you know his and, screen names online or his where he played or anything? He played online, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh it was something like something like John Smith was one of them, I believe. Yeah. Um, oh. but I don't I don't think he plays there anymore. Um, and then he never really played, I don't think he played as much no limit hold'em. Some point I think he did start playing some hyper, some hyper sitting goes and stuff, you know. I've definitely played with him, John Smith. If the na- if the screen name is John Smith, I played with him way back in the day on uh, Poker Star. Oh, really? You recognize yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, I recognize that name. That's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He did mostly switch to to PLO, but it's it's a pretty unique like there to be that to be world class at two things. I mean, it's very rare. Mm-hmm. I mean, Grichuk has got to be one of the few exceptions to that. I think uh, the few examples of that, and he also um stopped playing poker as seriously when the advent of the solvers, I think made it difficult to be elite at both things at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I think you kind of have to choose one. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's not really fun. I think of like Dan Smith. I, I think he's, he's probably better at, at poker than chess, but good at both, probably not elite at chess, but uh, it's, you, you really have to pick one if you want to try to be the best, you know? Yeah. And it's funny because as poker became more like chess, it became more difficult to be elite at both at the same time, which I think is kind of a funny riddle. Um, yeah. Chess but, is definitely ahead of poker with the solvers. Like you guys have had computers for 10, 15 years that kind of, you can study and look at what they do. We, we've just kind of developed good ones the last three or four years, I would say. Exactly. Like, and even our pedagogy and whatnot related to it is like really, um, you know, so, um, pre- so, so poor compared to chess, right? Like we have these solvers, but actually using them well, I think chess is like at least a decade ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Using PO solver for an amateur is like probably not even possible. They have to know how to do the simulations. They need a server. They need to put in the right sizes. It's, 
it's a study in its, in its own. Yeah. And the same is true with chess too, that like, it is a little harder, hard to use the computer super effectively, but I don't think it's as true because even if you're like playing some of your games on chess.com and you look and see how you messed up in your game 10, um, right after the game, because you know, you don't have time to like schedule a lesson and you play so many games, you can't even go over all of them. That's actually yeah. pretty effective. They tell you what you did wrong, you know? It's, it's, yeah. It's that helps. If, I, I usually, maybe you can, talk with me i usually just click game report and then i look at it'll tell you how many blunders how many miss like and then it shows you better moves is there is there something else i should be looking at too after the games no i think that's pretty good yeah okay i think it's pretty good stuff i mean it's not perfect like sometimes it's going to be a little it's 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 computer generated right so it's not going to have the human touch of understanding that like towards the end of the game you had one second left so it's kind of you know impossible yeah. for you to find a good game good move but overall, I think, yeah, it's definitely better than nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty, um, it's pretty good to just get that immediate feedback. Um, so, and we don't have anything like that in poker yet, right? Like you can, you can put a hand in the pile solver, but it's not, you can, you know, input hands that you played and get immediate feedback on, you know, where you messed up. At least I don't think so. There might be some programs that do something similar to that, that I'm not aware of yet, but I'm yeah, not aware of anything just, where you can just plug something in and they can report back your mistakes. They're just now developing that kind of stuff where it's like a trainer where you play against mm -hmm. the bot and um, right after the hand, you look at where you made, where you made mistakes, but that stuff's like just now kind of coming out. I think WPT has one and DTO. There's a trainer uh, that some European players made that does the same thing. Right. Dominique. Yeah. Yeah. Um, D yeah. I do have DTO and I found that to be the most similar in a way to like the typical chess training tools, but it's still like you're playing against the bot. It's not like I can say, Oh, here are these tournaments. I put uh, these hands I played in, you know, poker stars and input them and then get a feedback on what I did wrong. At least not yeah. yet. I don't think, but maybe that's coming. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. But anyway, um, so in this game, we're going to look at a mainline Sicilian, which is really the dream because it's the most exciting um, opening in chess, in my opinion. So uh, here, you know, white, the better they get, the more likely they are to avoid all those sidelines, especially against the move D6. And mm -hmm. indeed, Alexander Grishuk, who's often known as Sasha, uh, plays D4 here. And now he has a choice. He could take with the queen. But normally people take with a knight. And now black plays knight f6, which is a very flexible move. That that kind of ties into why we played d6. Mm -hmm. Because we just want to be able to attack this pawn without having to worry about e5, right? Mm -hmm. And by far the most po common move at this point is to play knight c3. Yep. It is possible to play f3, but it's pretty rare. Did you have a question? Um, no, no. This, this looks like... Um... Is this the scotch for white? Is it is it the same? It's it called the open like, Sicilian. Oh, okay. It kind of looks like positions I play as white a lot. But uh, yeah, go ahead. That's good. Maybe you can play it as white too, because it's a great opening for white too. The mm -hmm. scotch is similar, um, but because I saw you did play that in some opening. Um, and I'm glad because I think it's a pretty good opening. Um, it's mm -hmm. this, right? And what, what was the one he played? So the difference here is that they played E5. So you play for D4, but it's in a different, oh, okay. different constellation, right? You okay. see that? And this is a good opening as well. Um, and by the way, I saw the one game that you played here. Your opponent took on D4, which is not a good move. Mm -hmm. It's not a good move in the Sicilian. And it's not a good move against the Scotch because once the queen is developed here, it's actually a little bit tricky for black to continue developing. Um, because of this pesky e5 move mm -hmm. so that's that's a discussion for another day but I, I was happy to see you play the scotch i think it's smart because in the joker's gambit i think there's going to be a lot of people who aren't ready for it okay that's good uh so that, that one was good but we're back to the sicilian yep this unlike the scotch is like probably like this sixth most popular opening against e5 this is the most popular opening against the Sicilian. It's number okay. one. And now you have a lot of choices here. It's a lot of good moves. That's one of the reasons people like playing the Sicilian because there's a lot of flexibility. If one move doesn't work out, you can kind of switch to the other move. Mm -hmm. And let's see. Um, oh, wait a second. Let me just 
fix the board real quick. Oh no, it turned out okay. All right. So um in this position, what moves look okay to you for black, actually? Let me ask you. Um I think E5 looks okay. Um knight c6 looks okay and maybe bishop d7 but it seems a little passive okay those are some great options um two of them are definitely reasonable uh bishop okay. d7 is a real sideline it's not very popular it, did, it does have a name though i remember looking at it the other day cooper check variation apparently um knight c6 is very popular and it's a really good solid move um and the others you didn't get g6 is a good move it's called the dragon variation okay um a6 is good it's called the knight or variation that's what we're going to see here but e5 is not good and i think this is an important point to make because it looks like a very thematic move in the sicilian but it's not good because white has a really good move here um this is it's more of a strategic move than a tactical move but what do you think white might try here? He, uh, no, I mean, you could move uh, the knight again, maybe uh, knight f5. I mean, I would just keep chasing him out, though, I think, right? I'd play g6. Um, knight f5 is not that great, partly because okay. they could even they could, they could even play here and remove the defender of the knight. Yeah, um, true. Yeah. Uh, the best move is bishop b5 check. Oh, yeah. You show me that, yeah. It's just hard to meet here because if you play knight c6, you just lose material. If you play bishop d7, you, uh, you lose control over these light squares, okay. which is which is really problematic. It's very strategic, but it's like, do you know what it's called when you have a pawn here and it's both the C pawn and the E pawn are either removed or advanced? Have you ever heard the word backward pawn? I have heard that word, yeah. Yeah, that's what it is. This is okay. backward pawn because it can never be protected um, by one of its counters. I mean, one of its teammates. So you don't and want that. Yeah, generally you don't. Or if you do get it, you want to have like a... Um, a dream one day, and the dream is that you can play bishop e6 and, you know, one day get d5 in, and suddenly this, you know, you might need to prepare it a lot. You might have to play knight d7 and knight b6, but that one day this backward pawn will become a forward pawn again. <laughs> and it's, it also, you know, you have those two center pawns. So there are some like really cool things about this position. Okay. So that's kind of an advance. Um, concept, but it, it underscores and really explains why from Bobby Fisher to Gary Kasparov to, you know, now Sasha Grishuk, that the most popular move in this position is not the normal looking knight c6, or even the, the also normal looking g6, which kids love because it's called the dragon. <laughs> you know, you're trying to play bishop g7 and castle. What could make more sense? It's so logical. Yeah. Instead, the most popular move in this position, and I, if I turn on opening Explorer, it's going to tell me I'm right by, wow, I actually haven't looked at this in a while, and I'm surprised by how large a margin the most popular move is. Um, mm -hmm. It's A6 by, by a mile, um, 80,000 games with this compared to like 50,000 or 45,000 for the next most popular move. Wow. And it's all because of that e5 idea. Like basically, Black wants to play e5 without allowing Bishop e5 check. Although so not once, all. Go ahead. Yeah. So once we eliminate this Bishop b5 check, then e5 becomes okay. Yeah, because we're gonna stick our Bishop on e6, and event, and we're gonna have solid control over both of these weak squares, and we have the dream of eventually playing d5, which actually okay. does happen a fair amount. You know, it's not like. It, it, if white's not paying attention, d5 could happen. Or even if white's paying attention, just the natural course of the game, eventually black might get this free move in. Uh, okay. So it makes a big difference being able to have that back up. Um, but sometimes black only plays e6 too. It's, that's also an option. But usually they go for e5. That's kind of like the more um, traditional knight or idea. And I actually play the knight or um, a lot as well because I, I preferred the dragon 
but at some point it just became hard to only play one opening. Um, Mm -hmm. so I also stuck this one in there. So Grisha played F3, which is, it's, it's a good move. Do you have any idea why somebody might play F3 here? Mm. Um, defends that pawn twice now. And I mean, creates a nice looking pawn chain. I don't really know if that's a reason. Oh, it, um, it doesn't allow, um, it protects G4, which seems like a square that black might want to go to. Yeah. Um, that's a big part of it. And usually which way is white going to castle here? Well, now it looks like queen side. Exactly. Now we're going to castle queen side. So we don't really care that much that like our king is going to be weak if we castle king side. Like normally we wouldn't really want to move the F pawn unless we had time to play like king G1 to H1. But since we're going queen side, we don't really care. So yeah, that's why. And now E5, knight B3. And here we have that move, bishop e6 that we were talking about. Because, you know, knight f5 would be pretty weak now. You see the difference? Like, once you have this bishop here, you could just, I mean, you could do a lot of cool things here. Honestly, this is a great example of d5. Like, just just straight up and do it right now. Yeah. Can't, can't capture it because the knight just hangs. So already you can kind of see the power of that move. Mm-hmm. The backward pawn suddenly becoming the star. Um, so that's why Grisha played knight b3. Now bishop b6. In these scenarios, and this isn't just like this specific position, but I get it a lot where I have this opportunity to trade a bishop for a knight and double my opponent's pawns. Like when it like is that usually worth it? Like if we were to just take here on b3. I think here maybe it's not good because you could open the file for the rook, but is it usually worth it to to trade the bishop for a knight and double their pawns? Um, that's a good question. Um, no, usually not. It's usually um, because, not. Because the thing about double pawns is that they're not really bad. <laughs> like, I, I mean, actually, I, I can just say, like, double pawns are not bad. Double okay. pawns are bad, you know, as a general rule, if they're isolated and double. That's usually bad. Not always, but usually. But double pawns in essence are not really bad because um, every double pawn creates a little bit of a positional weakness because you know you don't have uh, pawns that are straight, but they actually create a dynamic strength, right? And you already mentioned it, a double pawns creates an open file, right? Mm-hmm. And so it just really depends on the position. Sometimes the dynamic strength of having an open file is worth way more than the small positional weakness. Sometimes okay. it's the opposite. Um, but I, I, it's not even like more common that they're bad. I don't think. And, okay. um, the other thing is bishops tend to be better than knights. So yeah, especially in open positions. Mm-hmm. So definitely not. And I actually think bishop b3 would be a positional blunder, um, in this particular position because of all the stuff we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. Good luck getting to play d5 now. Like, yeah, we need that bishop on, uh, yeah, it's just a horrible position now. I mean, I would just, I, you dominate the light squares now. Okay. So it's actually an instructive um, moment because the weaker a player is, the more likely they are to make trades that are unnecessary, especially if they're playing fast time controls. Yep. So it's good if you can kind of avoid that. So now we see both players kind of go after their plans, which is to castle. Um, and obviously white is gearing up to castle queen side. Mm-hmm. So already this is like chess, but it's a special type of chess because usually in chess, um, you, you're castled on the same side and certain rules come alongside that. Like the, the game, you usually aren't like throwing your pawns in front of your King because you know, that will make your King weak. Right. So, you know, I don't usually get a chance to play like G4 and G5 because if my King's here, then the advantage I get by pushing that pawn is usually, um, countered by the weakness I am by leaving my King so drafty. Mm -hmm. Whereas now all of the rules are like, you know, turned on their head. Now it's like both both sides are just trying to go bananas on each other. And this game, you know, we're, which we're, Grisha played 20 years ago is a great example of that. Like both players play their role to a T. Um, and we it starts off right away, B5. Um, okay. Oh, one, one minor thing I wanted to mention, if 
if white were to play G4 here, because I did this once in a blitz game, actually more by accident. I feel like every Sicilian player has done this like once, you know, just you're playing really fast blitz and you play G4 before playing queen side castles. Mm -hmm. And then your opponent just bangs out D5 and suddenly white's just way worse. Like this is a great example of how like it, it this D5 move is really, really freaking serious. Okay. Um, because with the position blasting open, um, and all of these moves, which might be aggressive if we have enough solidity, um, suddenly become massive liabilities. Like, you know, once, once start, things start to trade, like this is just terrible to have this move in. Like, yeah. You need to get your King safe first, right? Before you start. And the reason some the reason sometimes people miss this is because they think G5 is a saving grace here. Cause like, mm -hmm. they're like, Oh, I attack your knight. And then I take this, but why is that? Um, faulty logic. Black has a really good move here. Um, I mean, if you just keep pushing, like it's D4 a move, I don't know, I'll just keep pushing that pawn. Yeah, exactly. So it's like fork. It's nice yeah. in between moves. So then when they take here, you take here and they're going to lose one of these pieces. Yeah. Right. So that is like a nice little trick. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I think, you know, white is, white is already in trouble here. So that's why Grishik, of course, did not do that right away and instead waited a minute to play G4. He actually started with King B1, which is a move you see a lot when people castle queenside, just because the king is almost always better in B1 than C1. Mm -hmm. Because there's sometimes like a pesky check on this line, or sometimes like a queen gets to A5 and A2 is hanging. There's, yeah. there's always something, you know? Uh -huh. So I've that's had the why A2, I, I faced that A2 attack with the queen a lot, where people immediately go for it. So now he gets v4 in. Now we see knight b6. And you know what move do you think black is gearing up to play now? Um, I mean, b b4 push the pawn b4. Yeah, they would like to play something like b4. Um, you also have to worry about knight c4. There's a lot of different ideas here for black. Um, knight c4. Okay. Yeah, yeah, knight b c4 is good. But you're right. B4 is one of the big ones. B4, A5, A4 just kind of crash through. Um, one of the nice things about the Sicilian is that you have an open C file before they have any open files at all. So in mm -hmm. some ways, you could argue that you have a bit of a head start. Uh, but on the other hand, white usually has a little bit more faster development. So that that's usually like the tension that we see here. Um, can, you but go, can you go back one move? Like go back mm -hmm. and then go back. Could we have played, like, is knight, why doesn't knight d5, why isn't that good, like, for white? Like, yeah, that's that a good work? question. Um, there is a reason, like, first of all. It's only, yeah, well, I guess it's only. The there point. is, like, the, um, the, the, these guys are on a half open file, and, like, when we take, they're no longer on an open file, so that's a bit annoying. Okay. And then, secondly, it's, it's really. Er on, yeah. Well, we don't necessarily lose a pawn because if we play here, you cannot take it. So you're not going to lose D5. Mm -hmm. But now you can kind of see that a lot of the energy has been sucked out of the position. Like this queen and this rook now look kind of silly because they're just behind this pawn. And um, we can't even play bishop D3 that easily because this pawn hangs. And we're behind. You're ready to go. It's black. And yeah. I feel like we're like one move behind, you know. I agree. And, yeah. Once you once you play it out, it looks bad. Yeah. Although, but but the truth is, ninety five does come up a lot. Um, usually, it comes up a little bit later. Um, it, it sometimes comes up in situations where we can play for knight d five and like a knight a five, knight c six. Basically, it comes up in positions where white no longer believes in their king side attack and wants to try to play a little bit more positionally, but you have to be careful and execute it correctly. Okay. So here we have G4, knight B6, and now G5. And black has two options here. And this is actually a really critical juncture because they changed the dynamic of the game quite a bit. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I know which one I would pick if I were black. It's not the one picked in the game, but it's just a lot more comfortable to play. Knight D7? Knight D7 was played in the game, and it's like super dynamic after Knight D7. But I am a little bit afraid here. I personally would play Knight H5, and it the Knight's not very active on the square, obviously, but it, it actually does do a really good job of slowing the action down. It's, it's, it's a very pesky. It's not that easy to get rid of. Mm-hmm. And by the time you try to get rid of me, I might just sacrifice a pawn on F4 and, you know, just say whatever, because I'm like off attacking you. So I really prefer playing this because it's just so scary what happens in the game to black, but there is some advantages of having a knight here. It's, it can be an a, attacking piece. The knight on H5 is never going to actually directly attack this king. Whereas this- kinda- it prevents the H pawn from pushing. Is that, that the advantage having it on H5? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. You put a knight on H5. You know, you, you can't, you can play H4. I mean, not like knight G3 is the be all and end all. It's, it probably is pretty good here though, specifically, because what mm-hmm. I would do is I'd take this and then I'd play knight C4. And I feel like this bishop is the one I really want. Um, so I, I think here it actually would be really good for black, but mm-hmm. in general, it's more just that you can't push it forward. Okay. And it's a little tricky to slot just light. That, that's why occasionally you'll see people play h4 before playing g5. So they'll play like h4, h5, and then g5. Um, but the problem with trying that here is that if we did this, um, you would go for your like d5, b4 stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I actually watched a game that on. Magnus played on that um, like banner blitz that was like this, almost the exact same thing. And he pushed these pawns and... Um, checkmate them pretty quick yeah yeah it, it, it's definitely a better idea but the problem is the knight then has some opportunities to play like for d5 and stuff if if all things being equal yeah i'd rather play h4 h5 and then g5 but usually it's it's not completely equal the knight can kind of um really get involved in the action mm-hmm. so that's why grisha played g5 and now after queen c7 he played h5 that was kind of the idea he's ready just like blast open the vision and mm-hmm. black tries to do exactly the same thing um now white has a choice of two moves with this knight he can't go here he can't go here right it's got to be here or here knight d5 or knight e2 um and grisha did not like knight e2 because now black has a really annoying move what can black play here hmm. Bishop C4 doesn't really do anything, I don't think. Um, <laughs> rook. No, that doesn't work. I mean, I think you'd want to play Rook C8 at some point, but uh, I don't really see like a clear best move. Yeah, Wait. I would hope. I would probably start, I think Rook C8 is a good idea, but I'd probably start with Knight C4. Yeah, Knight C4 actually looks good because you attack the queen, yeah. Yeah, and now we're, you're really pushing me back. I mean, you're just yeah. creating all sorts of nasty threats. Knight E3, Queen E3, Queen C2 um, mating is the threat. And I mean, it's not even that easy for me to protect against this carnage, honestly. Yeah. Like, Because my bishop can't come to D3 anymore because of this Knight E2. So already black is just crushing. And this is why people play the Sicilian a lot because they know that if their opponent messes up, um, they're going to be able to capitalize on it. It's like the um, the margin for error is very, very small in, in the Sicilian. Like if you make one mistake, you could just lose the game. Whereas lots of other openings, like the French or something, you make one mm. mistake and it's like black gets another weakness to build upon, right? It, it's very different, um, very high stakes, basically, every move. It could be good for the Joker's Gambit where I'm sure there'll be lots of mistakes by everybody. Yeah, yeah, there is going to be a lot of mistakes, but not as much, I think, as in Pog Champs. I feel like ch- poker chess players, poker players have kind of been interested in chess for a while. Mm-hmm. So I think you guys have a little bit of a head start. Although some of the guys from Fox Champs got really good, but there were also a lot of like complete noobs. Um, whereas almost everybody playing in the Joker's Gambit, I feel like has some chess background. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. And I mean, I like that they we blocked out all the the good players, the actual chess players. Yeah, I feel like Fedor basically set the high bar. It was like you had to be like worse than Fedor, (laughs) (laughs) which is okay. Which is okay because I just you know he he better not win now. Yeah, he can't. I I hope he loses. I gotta say it. Fedor can't win. Uh, I think Dan Divorce is pretty good too. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, I mean, I think Chris Moneymaker is a wild card for me too. I know he had a lesson with Hikaru. I didn't get a chance to watch it, mm-hmm. but um, I played him in a chess Simon once, and he played quite quite well. Wow. Uh, okay. So I'm not sure about him. And then I know Liv Bury got was like really a complete noob when I played her for the first time, and she got so much better. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's a lot about how much work people are going to put into it too. Yeah, yeah, and how much they played as kids too, or. No, some people have like a bit of an advantage because they played more as children and the, they're just their brain kind of like latches onto it more quickly. Mm-hmm. Like if that fits Fedor and I think Chris Moneymaker too. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you play as a kid at all? I Probably when I was like eight or 10, I played a little bit with my dad, but um, not, not a lot, no. Yeah, but no. Even, even knowing the rules and stuff when you're really little, I think it's super helpful. Yeah, I knew the rules. And then in like middle school, I think I was in like the chess club and I played a little bit in middle school. Um, but not when I was very young. Not like not like my daughter, Fabi. Yeah, little Fabi. He's yeah. loving it. <laughs> He's loving the chess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah. Um, so Queen D3. Um, now, what do you think the idea of this is? Uh, this is a little complicated. Like Grishik now wants to come up with some like creative ways to attack. Um, and he needs to get his queen into the game because the queen is like the big gun. Um, you might wonder, like, I mean, my first instinct honestly would be to like play queen H2 because, you know, that seems like the normal place for the queen. Mm-hmm. But I think he wanted to keep an eye on um, defense at the same time as attacking. Uh, because he was worried about like this square right here, like yep. look, like suppose a three, and now if I try to play b three, um, you can threaten checkmate and one. Yeah, there's not much you can do. I mean, you have to play knight d three to stop it. It's the only move. But yeah. now your d pawn hangs, yeah. so it's kind of shows the delicacy of the Sicilian. Like he plays this move queen d three, which is kind of like a defensive move because now after a4 you also can sometimes play knight d2 um but it also just like kind of protects this square and he he did play knight d2 and then after a3 now is where things get completely nuts so he realizes that if he plays b3 he's gonna have like a permanent weakness and you even have to worry about like the fate of this pawn and sacrifices like taking on d5 and playing queen c3. So Grishik now decides just to play queen f5 and ignore all the chaos happening on this side of the board. Like what move do you think he's considering following this up with? He wants to create a battery using what other piece? He's going to put the bishop on uh, f uh, d3, right? Yeah, he's going to put yeah. the bishop on d3 and try to like induce a weakness and then, you know, try to like just between the bishop, the queen, and the rook, and the pawns, just like invade and, and checkmate, right? But it's kind of like a race because they're both just playing offense. Like who's who gets there faster? It's t- I can't calculate that. I guess he did here. Yeah, it's just pure. It is. It's pure calculation. And there's a gorgeous twist. This is like just like the coolest Sicilian game because on one hand, it's very um, like uh, basic. Like they follow all the basic plans just with precision because they're good, really good players. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there is one twist towards the end, which gives white the win. So black, obviously, I mean, we take a pawn and we crack open the position on your king. Like, you know, what is yeah. what, what could be wrong with that move? If that move loses, there's a good chance you're losing. So <laughs> might as well just go for it. Yeah. So now he, he threatens made in one. Mm-hmm. Jack made in one. So black really has only one move here, which is what? G6. Yeah, it has to play G6. And now pawn takes G6. So... Oh. If we do anything normal in this position, we're going to lose for sure. Like normal meaning, you know, say you take this pawn off. You can't do this because after check, um, what can white do here? Um, sacrifice the rook. Does that work? 
take on yep. H7? Yeah. Rook takes H7 is a maiden right. three, right? Yeah, you're stuck back there. Yeah, so, and Rook F7 isn't really much help. Everything just comes with a bang. And it's it's like tempo by tempo. Like Black just needs like one more move. It's almost like a pawning game. It's mm -hmm. whoever queens first. And you hear it's like whoever checks or captures first. So what would white do here? Um, here. I mean, can you take the, the pawn on G six with the bishop? Does that work? Yeah, that's totally winning. Um, I think rook H seven is even more clear though. Okay. Cause now you're just running checkmate in like a million different ways. And if they take, you know, you play queen takes F seven and rook H one, but your move wins too, I think. And it looks also because you are running checkmate with this move as well. And if here um, you just kind of circle around and it's kind of the same thing, right? If rook f7, you have now you have what? Um, g6. Yeah, I think this is your idea. Yeah, this, look, this looks totally crushing too. Okay. So, yeah, it, basically, you can't do anything normal here. Like, if you do something normal, you just lose. So, what so, do you do? Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> you need to save like one move or you need to get the initiative. Like they're trying to checkmate you. So you need to try to checkmate them. Mm -hmm. The fastest way to checkmate them, I guess. I mean, you could take on a two with the rook. Yep. And that is exactly. I don't really exactly. see the follow up though. I mean, it, it gives you time, I guess, but. Yeah, it does give you time. Well, the idea is first of all, if you play pawn takes h7, this is kind of a funny and instructive situation, which is so important. Like king h8, now um, white just totally screwed themselves because the pawn is actually acting as a shield for our own king. So it's like, it looks like you have all this like great attacking, but it's actually like you have nothing anymore. Okay. Yeah, so g takes h7 does nothing. And that's cool because you know, that's the only check in this position that white has, except for queen takes f7. Mm -hmm. And if they play king takes a2, now what can you do? Queen a7? Yeah, queen a7 check wins. Um, I, I was thinking rook a8 check seems. Oh, yeah, I guess that's, yeah. yeah. Either now, way, it's, it's really bad for white, right? Yeah. And now you have what? Well, actually, I should show a little bit more resistance. It's, it's actually, uh, you have to be a little queen clever a, there. Queen A1 checkmate? Mm -mm. Knight B1. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's why I, I needed to show some more resistance. Because it's actually a little tricky here what to do. Because actually, Knight B1, White's probably winning. Because you don't have any other checks. And, you know, once you're out of checks, it's, you know, it's White's turn. <laughs> and <laughs> that's not going to be good. Um, Can you do Knight A4 and then Queen B2? Does that work? Um, or you don't want to block the rook? Does knight a4 work? That's a very good question. Um, let me think about that. There's queen f7 and queen h7 mate, so no. I, if you had your rook still on f8, maybe, but... Push the pawn? Is queen B3? f7 is just mate. It's B3? No, because queen f7, queen h7 is a threat of mate on the board, right? Oh. Uh, so yeah, everything you, you do has to be a check, or you wow. lose. Yeah. But that makes it easy in a way to analyze. It makes it because it's everything's forcing. Like you can't look at moves like knight a4 or b3 because they're just immediately eliminated. So is there anything else that you're missing? You looked at queen a1 check. Um, like rook, rook a1 check? Knight b1 also. And, you know, you could look at queen a3 check because my knight is pinned, but then king d2 and I've got my sneakers on. Oh, true. You sneak out the other side. Um, What's the other? There's a check. Uh, knight. A uh, queen A3. Mm -hmm. Queen A3, yeah. Queen A3, it's just a little um, creeping move, I guess you could call it. And then you force me back. And now. Now there's no knight B1, so you can play mm -hmm. queen A1. Yeah. Is that mate? Looks like Yeah, mate. that's checkmate. Okay. That's hashtag. There it is. <laughs> um, you're, and your, your move, I think, is winning too, because if king B1, queen A1 is made in one. Mm -hmm. And if king b2, 
<sighs> Let's see what, why is this one winning? Uh, this one's more complicated, I think. Because I think your move now, like I, I mentioned earlier with this rook on f8, queen f7 and queen h7 made is not a threat, you know? So I think that's why this position is winning for black. You just in the nick of time, you threaten mate in two different ways. Yeah. And, you know, pawn takes h7, I shield myself with your own pawn. So yeah, it's correct. But I think the, I, I always prefer to make it checks the whole way along. It's a what better happens practice. If you, what happens if, white takes on f7 and then is it i guess that doesn't work huh no, it doesn't work. yeah i can play rook f7 and then you're out of checks that's a problem yeah there's no checks yeah yeah so rook a2 looks really um looks like looks like black is gonna win now actually right because yeah. there's no more um there's no more king takes a2 there's g takes h7 doesn't work pawn takes f7 doesn't work as you mentioned there's rook f7 but um, Grisha played a remarkable move here that I just think is hilarious. So this is the actual game. This is where it was. Yeah, this is the actual game. Rook A2 actually happened. I mean, Black probably was feeling pretty good right now. Well, I don't know. Maybe they saw this move because it's like process of elimination at some point. But it you you have a very direct threat. Rook A1 check, King B2, Queen C3 is mate, right? Mm-hmm. So white and pulls a crazy move here. Yeah, so you got to try something. I mean, there could be other things to try here, like knight e4 maybe. But I'm just afraid, like, if white doesn't keep the initiative, it just always feels like black's going to um, double rooks and just give a checkmate. Mm -hmm. So he came up with a, it, just an insane move. Which the just... queen takes f7? Does that work? No, queen f7, there should be, it's worth looking at though. You always want to look at forcing moves when, you know, you're on a nice edge like this. Yeah, I just saw takes, takes, rook h7, but I don't know how much is there. Probably not much. Yeah, there's just not enough because at the end of the day, we're still threatening to mate you. And I guess you'd have to take on a2, but then the queen and the knight will probably combine to checkmate you. Okay. So the move he played is a move, oh, I should give you a hint. It's a move that chess.com gets a lot of angry emails about especially from like new players it's the most famous bug in the history of chess.com i don't know what that is well, you, well it's it it's um it's the uh it's the move that people think like if you play it if they don't know all the rules of chess they're like you're cheating i don't know <laughs> I don't, let, let's see, has Cora learned this move yet? It's not castling. Like en passant? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, so, um, Grishik played a move here allowing en passant. And it C4. looks absolutely horrible. Yeah, it looks absolutely horrible. It looks works. like such a terrible move because it allows like pawn take C3, right? But this yeah. is the exact flip side of what we just looked at. The pawn is actually stopping the queen from coming in. And so it's actually serving as like a shield, which is so insane. And if you did play pawn takes c3, Grishuk's now winning. What can he play here? Not g takes f7, because then rook f7. Not g takes h7, because then you just play king h8. But because there's no mate threat anymore, white actually has that beautiful tempo to do his own thing and try to get a mate. Um, is it a uh, G7? Is that yeah. yeah, yeah. So instead of using the pawn to give check, you just want to get rid of the pawn as soon as possible so you can bring the big gun in. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and it, you know, certainly there's a, still a lot to be afraid of, but the problem is the king is just again has their running shoes on, and you just you run out of checks. Or yeah. I would also be afraid of this move. Be very afraid of that move. Because it kind of looks like it's going to be mate, but somehow it's not. Somehow it's not checkmate. And then when the checks stop, you know, again, it's white's turn and it's all over. Yeah. Yeah. So the C4 move is just, at, I mean, if somebody played that against me and I didn't see it, <coughs> I would be Sorry. very demoralized. <laughs> if somebody played that against me and I didn't see it, I'd be very demoralized. <laughs> yeah, that's not a move I would look for. Um, it's, a, it's amazing that it works. But there's still a few, it, it doesn't quite end. That's the amazing thing about this game. Like every single game is like a joke and like a counter joke. I, I just mm -hmm. love this game. 
Black now played knight takes d5, which also looks fantastic because you're threatening checkmate, kind of, not one, knight c3, king c2, and then what would be a mate here? Like, so, so if I play g7 here, how, how could you mate me? If you play g7. Um, does making the queen win? Yeah, queen or a rook actually is made in one because it's a, just the- that's, that's really flexing on them if you make the rook, right? <laughs> I know, right? That would be pretty ridiculous. That'd be unprofessional probably. Don't make a bishop though, because then there's king c1. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So knight c3 check is a threat. So you can't play g7 anymore. So now, now you played another insane looking move, um, which, you know, I just can't believe this game keeps going. He, preve he prevents knight c3 by playing bishop d4, leaving his bishop in take. And now, um, Black plays another extraordinary move. There's nobody doing what looks like makes sense. Yeah. Um, and this this move might actually be a mistake, but it's a very beautiful mistake. Beautiful mistake. So he loves this idea. I mean, who wouldn't love this idea of knight c3 check and then queen or rook and checkmate? So, you know, white gives up their bishop thinking that like, you know, knight c3 now, bishop takes c3 and g7 and we win again, right? Again, uh -huh. we're getting shielded. There we go. Okay. And you don't want to take on E3. You don't want to take with the E pawn. You don't want to take the bishop. Then Actually, that's the, probably a good move. That is probably the, thing. that's probably the best move because then you, you don't have time for G7 because of knight C3. But black played something that's like really spectacular. It didn't end up working, but it's really quite beautiful. So- okay. He wanted to use this queen to distract this bishop to try to get knight c3 mate. So where do you think he put this queen? Um, a7. Yeah. So he played this gorgeous queen sacrifice. That's gorgeous, bait. but but bad. Yeah, bait, exactly. Uh, but then, you know. But wouldn't he see, the other player would see that, right? They wouldn't take it, I would think. Well, yeah, but I'm sure he also thought that rook a1 check now is even more scary because of like, um, queen a4 and b3 and maybe queen a2 but unfortunately um, the party ends because Grisha had all calculated and he finally gets to play this move so he ignores the queen and he finally gets to play this move we've been dying to play all game g7 because he had calculated that the checks don't amount to anything Um, and, you know, luckily for white, he doesn't have to take on B2 because then there'd be a checkmate in one. And he's you block with the knight here. Yeah. yeah. And he's pretty safe. Well. Yeah. I mean, there's no black, more checks. Yeah. Black makes a queen. You take it with the rook. Yeah. There yeah. is one more check. You do. Yeah. There's one more check. And then you have to, you could check again here, I guess. But there, you're, you're, really, you're running out of checks quickly, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, there's no more. And then when you finally have to stop, the problem is you're getting made. You get made it. Yeah. yeah. So after G7, like the game basically ended. But I just thought that was like this is what the Sicilian is all about. Like basically that game was just like punch, 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 counter punch, and like yeah. and all of the things that like mostly moves that like were kind of unexpected. I mean, they're great players, so maybe they saw a lot of them. But like for an an observer just like going over the game, you're like, well. Every move is just like coming from nowhere, especially C4, that move. Yeah, especially at the end there. That's uh, that's cool. I like yeah. games like that where it's opposite castles. It kind of makes more attacking, exciting chess. I think. Me too. And the, the, the mainstream opening that most likely leads to that is the Sicilian, which is why I really like the Sicilian. Mm -hmm. And I thought this game would be good for you just to just to try to remember the move order in the beginning of the game. If you play the Sicilian, um, okay. to, you know, get that down with D six. And what's a, what's a good like number of moves I should kind of try to be prepared for like at my level, like three or four, like. Depends on the opening. Mean? I mean, okay. some openings less than others. I'd say like the, the Sicilian, maybe a little bit more than other openings. And okay. then some of your, less common openings a little more i mean a little less there's also just some openings where theory doesn't really matter very much okay 
So it's hard to give an exact number, but it mm-hmm. is, it is true that it's, it's better to like, know what you're going to do and move three or four against every opening than to like, just like study one opening a lot and just, you know, have no clue when your opponent plays like D4 or something. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely worthwhile. And, you know, another important thing is just not to care if somebody plays something you haven't seen before, because you don't want to get psychologically broken or disturbed by somebody doing something weird. Yeah, and at my very... level, I kind of assume if I haven't seen it before and it looks weird that it's bad. Yeah, like, it's that's probably good. a really bad move. Or at least it's not optimal. And, you know, because I think it's it's in this type of tournament, like the Joker's Gambit, you're going to see a lot of random stuff. Yeah. You know, just people in, making up something in the last minute, forgetting. And, you know, ultimately those tactics that it sounds like uh, Dina also told you to go over are really important. Yeah, so, you're better at those. Yeah. You, you said you do um, Puzzle Rash, is that what you said? Yeah, she said to do the survival one where it's like if you get three strikes, you're out. So I, I, um, I do that one usually. Yeah, what's your number now? You got 19. You should you should get higher than 19, I think. Yeah, I usually yeah. don't even get that. I got like 10. I did it just now. I'm I'm not very good. That's surprising because it seems like you saw stuff pretty quickly in our last end. Maybe you tried the survival kind. You you could go back to the regular five minute kind too. Okay. Um, you know, no. The survival kind is where the five minute kind is where you're timed and you can lose by either getting street strikes or the five minutes running out, right? Mm-hmm. Where survival, you have you have enough time. It's just if you get them wrong, you're out, right? Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. Yeah. Your 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 puzzle rush scores should be higher than this for sure. But you haven't done that many attempts, so I think that's a real issue. And yeah, your puzzle I'll... rating is really low too. You think I should spend more time on that than actually playing? For Not prep? necessarily more, but at least maybe a maybe more than you do now like how many games do you play like what two two games a day or something probably something like that yeah two or three yeah i'd stick to two games and then do a little bit more puzzles because i feel like with your strength your puzzle rating should be more like 1700 and your puzzle rush score um should be like definitely like a lot higher like at least six higher um and i don't why does it matter because you just want to try, make, get some confidence that you're getting better in that area. I think, yeah. you know, that you can like see things quickly mm-hmm. because, you know, it will come up and I think you're, you're learning, like, it'll be much easier for you to, to have gains in those areas than anything else. Cause I can see by analyzing with me that your, your puzzle rating should be like 500 points higher for sure. I wish they would just tell you what you're looking for. Like it's a checkmate or it's a hanging piece or remove the defender. I wish they give you like a little prompt of what, but I guess when you play actual game, they don't give you that either. Exactly. So it's kind of good that they don't. But there are books yeah. like that. There are books like that. And you should get Quora some books because I think okay. maybe not now, but like eventually, because I do think that I've heard from a lot of chess coaches that if they only look at screens, eventually they sometimes hit a bit of a plateau because they kind of get bored of that. Mm-hmm. So eventually you might want to get her some kind of book and then you can solve it at the same time as her. Yes, I'll be getting better with her. Yes, I think so. I think so. Yeah. All right. Well, I hope you I hope you um, learn from this. And, you know, let me know if you have any questions, because I obviously went through a lot. And awesome. No, this is amazing and uh, should help me out. And thanks so much for spending the time. Yeah, no worries. Well, now, you know, the real John Smith. Yeah, that's crazy that that's him. <laughs> is he Russian? Is he from Russia? Yeah, yeah, he's yeah that makes sense. Russian you look up players. Alexander Grishuk later. He's one of the greatest chess players of all time. I mean, okay. many people think that he'd be world champion if it wasn't for his, um, he has a massive addiction to time pressure. Okay. Yeah, he's like the biggest time pressure addict in all of chess, which is kind of hilarious because you'd think that like poker players are like ruthlessly pragmatic. Yeah. And it would somehow be the opposite. But I don't know. I guess genius works in strange ways. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I'll look into him. <laughs> all right. Thanks, all right. Bye. Bye-bye. You're welcome.